Have you ever wondered what it'd be like to have a whole team of factory technicians available to help tune your suspension? Well, the answer might be right here in this new data acquisition system from Motion Instruments. And you know, someone like Greg Menard, the winningest racer of all time, but also one of the biggest puzzlers on the circuit, gives it a seal of approval, it's probably pretty good. Let's have a closer look. We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. Do all the clickers leave you wondering, what do they actually do? When you turn the knobs, is the result not what you're looking for? You have trouble deciding whether you should run an air shock or a coil spring? Taking what you feel and explaining it? Or taking that feeling and translating it into some meaningful adjustment that you can make at the shock that makes the ride better? You can feel the faster rebound. It's almost like it's pushing you out at the apex. I've had this system for about a month now. On this SB150, some brand new Fox suspension I've been trying to get dialed. Can we say dialed? Is that a Fox thing? I think they have that word copyrighted actually. Not only did it minimize the amount of time it took for me to get a solid base setting, but it's allowed me to make small tweaks to see if alternative setups are still viable. It may look small, but it's packed with features. And in a three year collaboration with Greg Menar, the winningest downhill racer of all time, they've designed a system that takes massive amounts of data and condenses it into a really user-friendly format that you can view on your phone. So what is data acquisition? It's what it sounds like. It takes all the information and the movements of your suspension and it stores it in this little logger. That's massive amounts of information. Then it aggregates it and displays it in such a way that you can understand it. And it allows you to compare the motion of your front and rear axles together to see if your bike is in balance, if you're using all of your travel too much or too little? Is it ramping up too hard? And there's lots of different ways that you can look at it. Do you really do get the most bang for your buck with this one? It consists of a linear potentiometer at the rear shock, I'm just going to call it a pot, and at the front you get this fork tracer. The only difference between this system and the more expensive pro system uh, is that you get a pot front and rear. You also get to spend about $500 more. Here's the potentiometer mounted on the back of the bike. I've got a sticky bracket here mounted to the shock. I bent it a little bit just to make it fit the shock body. Uh, the zip tie that's there was just for when the, the glue was kind of curing, but I never took it off. It hasn't slipped, so I've left it. That little red zip tie is just something visual for the videos we're going to see later. Up here we have another rounded mounting bracket that I've then gone and taken an O-ring and attached it that way. As it heated up over time, the glue on the tape kind of came loose and it slid around. And then this mount right here allows for a bit of movement. So if you hit something really hard and crash and knock this off, it doesn't end up smashing your $500 unit to pieces on the side of the trail. Uh, there's other ways you can mount this too. I think if I was going to do this permanently, I'd mount it here and put a permanent sticky mount up here just for a little bit cleaner look and ease of getting it on and off. I don't know if you can see it here. I have a ride rat frame protector keeping my pretty yellow paint job looking fresh and I was worried that putting something sticky on there might peel it up when I took it off. I also wanted to see if there was a way to mount this on the shock so that it didn't have to touch the frame. Pretty clean, the cable's tucked underneath, the data logger zip tied to the top tube. Up front we have this fork tracer, it's a little bit louder. The potentiometer, easy to take on and off. Just has this magnetized little roller that goes up and down. Slides along this track, transmits data that way. Pretty easy to reinstall. It's magnetic, so it kind of holds itself in place. Kind of line it up. If you had your top cop on and you're good to go. One of the only downsides I'd say to this is that it's kind of bulky looking. In this case, it sticks out to the side because the Fox 38 fart buttons get in the way of where you'd normally mount it. It does make a little bit of noise, but you don't seem to hear it on the trail.
Potentially, there's maybe a touch more friction in the system, but it's not that stick slip friction that you get from sticky bushings or sticky seals. It'd just be a little bit of roller bearing friction. I don't think it's anything that changes the performance of the fork at all. On the handlebar, there's a little button for marking different spots on the trail so you can back and find them later. Uh, it's really useful for dropping pins along a ride so you can go back and analyze the data just between two points. So now that we've got everything mounted and we've got the app initially set up, the first thing we want to go ahead and do is calibrate our sensors and then I'll show you how you can really quickly check sag without having to use the O-rings or a tape measure on your bike. So the next thing you want to do is open the Motion IQ app on your phone. There it is. Uh, click on your bike, wake up your sensors, make sure your Bluetooth is on, they'll buzz as they come on. Go down to the right hand corner, press calibrate, just to make sure that if stuff hasn't shifted, uh, as long as the bottom it is, it's just going to tell you to lift your bike off the ground, press done, now they're calibrated. Now I can go ahead and hit sag. So I'm going to hit the sag button that's on here at the bottom, you get up here, Give it a few bounces. Normally now you'd have to get off your bike without moving the O-rings and slide them down, but I can just hit this little button right here and it's recorded my sag. We're at 26 millimeters in the front, 16 millimeters in the back. One of the things you want to make sure you're doing is being consistent with how much you weigh because that has a huge impact on how your suspension feels. Riding around in the woods in street clothes versus riding gear can be a difference of about five pounds. So you want to make sure when you're doing your testing that you're wearing the same clothes you're going to be riding or racing in. <laughs> One of the last things I do, even if I'm just doing shovel runs or riding the bike park, is I fill up about a half a bottle of water, just so it's always the same. And we're good to go. And our first couple runs, we're really ignoring most of the data. We're really focusing mostly on spring rate, making sure we have the correct one, that we're using appropriate amounts of travel, that we're kind of using full travel, uh, that we're not bottoming it out everywhere, or we're not sitting way too high. Uh, we're really paying attention also to the histogram to see if we have the correct amount of tokens in the fork. If we look at the compression stroke histogram, basically this graph shows every instance that we hit a certain amount of travel. Um, you can see we spent a lot of time around the 60% range, not much after that, and there's a pretty steep dive, which indicates that our spring curve ramps up quite a bit right there. This is a really useful tool. If you want to make the slope less steep, then you can take a volume spacer out. If you want to steepen it in a certain place and you can see where that happens, you put a volume spacer in. If you want to shift the whole graph to the left, you add air. If you want to shift the whole graph to the right, you take air out. I prefer a fairly linear setup where it doesn't bottom out too hard, but where I do use full travel most of the time. I found it's more comfortable for really long riding. If I was just going to the bike park and smashing out laps or doing downhill runs, and resting a lot in between, I'd probably put that volume spacer back in, uh, but I find it's really hard to hold onto a bike like that over a long day. I'm also paying a lot of attention to how the balance feels um, from the rider standpoint without looking at the data, especially in corners. I feel like I can ride a bike that's a bit seesawy if I'm going in a straight line, but it's really hard to ride it through corners if the back is squatting or the front is diving. After getting spring right right, the next things you want to check is rebound. One of the things that came apparent to me using this app is that I was not running mine fast enough. And throughout the test sessions, I kept toggling it back faster and faster. Uh, until at this point, we're talking one click away from fully opened on the high speed rebound and four clicks away from fully opened on the low speed rebound. So that's minus seven and minus 15. That's pretty quick. On the fork, I've got it pretty much where Fox recommends. I forgot what it was. Always write it down. Fork is high speed rebound minus 7 out of 8. 
the low speed rebound minus eight. I don't know how many it actually has. Mine's just a minus eight from fully closed. I tend to mess around with the rebound a little bit more. Sometimes you just want the back end to sit a bit, depending on where you're riding. And sometimes you want it a little bit quicker. You can feel the faster rebound coming out of the corners. The bike just wants to sit back up into its best geometry. And it's like you're all set for the transition to the next one. It's almost like it's pushing you out at the apex. First and foremost, I'm paying attention to how the bike feels underneath me going around corners. And I can tell right away that the front is sitting up a little bit high and the back is squatting down a little bit low. If I had to hazard a guess, I'd say we need to take a volume spacer out of the fork and then we need to speed up the rebound in the rear. And that's exactly what we ended up doing. Took one volume spacer out of the fork, kept the pressure the same, kept the fork rebound the same, kept the rear shock air pressure the same, Still one volume spacer, but opened up the rebound considerably. So we go into our recordings. Let's just select one. We'll do a short one. I don't want the whole thing because there's parts where I was just sitting on my bike or riding on flat ground. So we'll select two tracers between pin one and pin two. And this is where I was actually descending. Hit done. And now we can look at it. First thing we'll just go and do is look at the front fork. And we can see its minimum position, its maximum position, almost bottomed out, 96%, 164 mil of travel. Its total movement was 14 millimeters. We can look at the compression stroke count, the maximum speed, the average speed. Uh, we can look at the rebound strokes and the same thing. We can also look at the histogram, which you'll see now is a lot more linear than what we'd seen before. We can look at how many times we went into the deep stroke you know if you're spending a lot of time down here you're probably bottoming out quite a bit maybe it's too soft you click on it you can see how many you had so just two of them just one of them at 170. we can do the same thing with the rear again kind of a nice linear curve to our histogram no steep drop-offs and we're not spending a ton of time over in the bottom half of the travel. Uh, you can see in axle position, our average is 56.4 millimeters. So it's sitting right around the 37% range. That's, that's effectively our dynamic sag range for the extent of the riding. Now that will change depending on how steep or how your trail is or how much sort of flat pedally bits there are when you're logging data, but it's not bad to look at. And if you look at the front, we're at 26%. So we've got dynamic sag of 26% in the front and 37 in the back, so it's sitting just a little bit lower. Let me look at balance. Not bad, 8.3%. The orange line is the rear shock, and the blue is the fork. If the blue line is lower, then it's just a little bit stiffer. If the blue line is above the orange, then your fork is a little bit softer. We have it set to percent of travel because we have different strokes front and rear. We've got a 170 front, 150 rear, but we could set them to millimeters and look at it that way. Uh, we have the front speed set to vertical, but we could switch it to the fork. So we're looking at the actual fork tra travel on the 64 degree plane from the head angle. And for high school math class, sine of 64 degrees, opposite over hypotenuse, 64 times 170 gives us 152.8, meaning that the front and rear travel vertically on this bike is actually relatively the same. It's 150 rear in the back. 150-ish in the front. So you can look at fork travel on the app both ways. You can see it in actual millimeters, 170 millimeters, or you can see it as vertical travel relative to the ground at more like 152. Uh, I would argue there's times where you want to look at both, and I usually toggle back and forth between the two to make sure they're not too far off. You notice here, is it shows the fork is actually looking a little bit softer. Another thing we can look at that I spend quite a bit of time on is the zenith, which is showing you where the dampers are in their 
stroke when they stop moving in one direction and start going the other way. So this is a compression zenith, and it'll tell you uh, if you're using kind of equal amounts of travel at this front and rear. You hit a bump, your fork or your shock starts at some point, at some position of zero motion. It accelerates, hits its peak velocity somewhere around here before it starts to slow down because the spring force increases and the damping hopefully is doing something. And then it stops ever so slightly before it re-accelerates on the rebound stroke, hits peak velocity and slows down again and stops either at top out or you hit another bump and this cycle repeats itself. This point right here, motion IQ is going to refer to as C. Because the dampers have to stop moving your fork and your shock both have to stop moving at some point before they can rebound. And this is looking at where that point was. Again, the closer you get this together, the more you have balance in terms of using equal amounts of travel. Look at the first graph, we're seeing balance based more on speed. Now this is speed at the rear axle, not at the actual damper. If you want to look at how fast your rear shock is moving, there is a way to do that, but that's not what we're looking at now. This is looking at the actual calculated speed of the axles front and rear, not of the dampers themselves. Another interesting feature is you can make reports. So if you do a whole bunch of runs and change a bunch of things, you can keep track of it and then you can go in and enter which parameters you want to look at. I'll just tick, pick this one. And this has six runs that I took in the course of the day and all the different figures for Fork compression count, fork rebound, average compression, 95% compression speed, shock rebound time, total movement, blah, 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 blah. Right. If you like spreadsheets, this is for you. Personally, I like to look more at the balance data and also the waveform. We can pinch this and we can expand it. And what this is, is a graph of your front and rear axle compression in millimeters over time. What you want to see is that they're reasonably close. Usually the fork is going to react first and the rear follows, so they won't always be lined up. But it's a great way to see if you're really, really out of balance. You might have noticed in this one that showing my fork is moving a little bit more than the rear shock. I didn't actually like this setting. If we go back and we look at my balance data, you might see why. It shows that I'm super balanced, right, mathematically. This is a pretty steep trail. I don't want the fork softer than the rear. Uh, for the most part, I found that my bike feels best to me when I could get these figures anywhere from like 6 to 15%. Anywhere outside of that, and then I could tell that it was either a little bit stiff in the front or a little bit too soft. Um, you can do the same run multiple times and get slightly different values. So I would suggest you definitely do it quite a few times and you'll figure out what feels best for you. But you don't want to be a slave to these lines the whole time because it's just mathematical balance. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to feel good. So what are my final thoughts? I think it's great. It's obviously not for everybody. It's not priced for everybody. Um, but in the hands of a competent tuner or somebody motivated to learn, it's a fantastic tool for getting your suspension dialed in. Even though I found that mathematical balance wasn't necessarily for me, I think it's a, a good goal to work towards, if nothing else, just to learn the lessons of how the adjustments on your suspension work and how they affect the ride characteristics. You may get there and like it, or you might get there and find out like me, you, you want it a little bit different, but at least you know what you're shooting for. Again, it is a bit pricey. Um, I could see this being used by shops that want to rent it out or have a competent technician who who wants to have you know tuning days or you know at the local trails uh, or maybe a group of friends want to buy one in the downhill racing uh, i could also see buying the app for just the months where you're racing or riding and then not having that for some of the other months um, you know it's up to you the tools are there i i do wish sometimes that it gave you a little bit of support as far as what numbers you should shoot for. It's one thing to say, I want to make sure your rebound is fast enough. What's fast rebound? You know, what, what numbers should I be aiming for? Um, that might be a little bit helpful. Um, but on the other hand, it, it's, it's 
nice that you're left to your own devices to tune this thing um, without somebody telling you that this is how you're supposed to run it. Because every suspension tuner I've talked to um, has a slightly different approach to how they think a bike should be set up. And none of them are wrong. Uh, they're all just going about it a slightly different way, how they interpret it. Uh, and really, that's up to the rider to figure out. And this is a fantastic tool to get you um, as close as possible to your optimum setup.